some of the things we did in Maribel now. Um, you'll get a chance to and you'll be able to see some things, certainly in Columbus. And in Columbus, you saw our helicopter operation. But the thing that, that struck me when I came here, and again, I'm only here a year now. Seems, seems like it's been longer, but it's been a year. Um, and it's been a very, very interesting year. But as I, as I look at it, I did not know that this company was, do, it was building helicopters 50 years ago. And you've learned that. And I think what that tells you is we do persevere to Marianne's point in the film. We, we aren't here to just start, try, and stop. We invest in the businesses and we invest in the communities. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But when we talk about the helicopters, you saw that we're, we're not only a player in the business, but we're a leading player in that business. And then you move on to commercial. As you saw, Eastern Airlines, I think you saw the picture of uh, for the film of uh, Frank Borman, for those of you didn't know who that was, that was the uh, former uh, uh, CEO of, uh, of Eastern. Um, over that last 40 years, we've been able to change the dynamic here in the U.S. Not only in terms of airplanes, the types of airplanes, but the competitive dynamic. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Now, what have we done on the commercial side? We started a training center, then an engineering center, then another engineering center, then another training center. Is there a trend here? Is we continue to grow. We continue to build, and you'll continue to see us do that. Think about it. We started, when you look back 40 years ago, 125 Airbus airplanes flying in the U.S. Now, more than 1,500 airplanes in the U.S. and 2,400 across the Americas. Think about that growth over a relatively short period of time. And then looking at a part of the business not everyone focuses on, but we do, and that's our defense and homeland security business. We had our first helicopter to the U.S. Coast Guard in 1985, our first patrol plane to the Coast Guard in 2006, our first radar system to the U.S. Navy in 2005, and our first helicopter to the Navy in 2009. Then, as you, I'm sure you've heard, because our helicopter team is very proud of this and they should be, we started the Lakota program. 420 helicopters training U.S. Army helicopter pilots every single day. And we are proud of the program that's on time, on budget, and I know that the military is very, very happy. So, so our team is also very happy. Um, but we're not just a sales organization. And we're not here to just be in the Americas because we see a short-term opportunity. We're here because we invest in the community. We, we are a global aerospace company that invests in its local communities, and we're a good corporate citizen. So what do I mean by that? So let's just move on for one second as a, and, and look at some of the other things we've done in terms of investments. One web satellites, have you heard of that? Melbourne, Florida, Space Coast. It is a, a LEO constellation, over 600 satellites. It will enable internet connectivity around the world, making a difference for people globally. Then, obviously, we have our expansion here. But less obviously, let's talk about some of the things that we invest in. And the supply chain is one. You saw a number that, uh, when I first came here, I was surprised about, and that's $200 billion. <coughs> Think about that, $200 billion since 1990. In, in 2005, we were investing $8.5 billion a year. Today, we're investing $17 billion in the supply chain. About 40% of all Airbus-related parts 
are procured, procured here in the U.S. And Airbus is the single largest consumer of U.S. aerospace exports. Larger than any other company and larger than any other country. You saw the, another number in the film, 275,000. By investing in that supply chain, we are investing in suppliers, and those suppliers are employing people all over the region. And we are proud of that. The communities themselves, when we invest in the, in the supply chain, when we invest in our valves, when we invest in our engineering centers, it's not just an investment in this specific entity. It's an investment in the community. It's an investment in the local diner. It's an investment in the local car dealership. Because our employees are out every day involved in their communities. And we're, we're proud of that. One of the other things we're doing is what it works out about. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but hopefully we'll get a chance to show you um, a little bit about what we're doing. And it's really a vocational educational center right here in Louisville. We want to create opportunities for young people in aerospace. So when we think about some of the other things we do in the community, and you'll hear Airbus talk about the community a lot, because it is important. One of the things that I found surprising when I came is when we, when we donate, we being employees of Airbus, to United Way, Airbus matches 75 cents on the dollar. So for every dollar an Airbus employee sends to United Way, Airbus invests 75 cents in the community or in the specific charity. And I think that is a sign of truly investing in the community. So let's talk about other observations. We're, we're not just competing with the U.S. We don't compete with the U.S. We're competing in the U.S. We believe in competition. So we are here every single day building our businesses, building, helping to provide for our employees' families to make sure that we can build the best organizations in the world right here in the United States. And we believe in competition, and the best way to do that is to be local, understand your communities, and then go out there and win. So, when we think about winning, what does that mean? Hundreds of suppliers in more than 40 states. Our employees are in every, in, excuse me, in every single um, uh, state, well, excuse me, <laughs> I look at this and I say 40 states, the, the growth in those states is phenomenal. So the fact of the matter is we're continuing to build on individual states and we have our focus states. And then we have hundreds of small businesses surrounded by those. We are present with all these with all these customers, with all, and we're investing in the customer, we're investing in the community. Job creation is important to us. So, we talked about the U.S., we talked about helicopters, we talked about mobile, we talked about one web. You saw what we're doing with AQ, our innovation lab. We have a venture company. You saw what we're doing there. We're continuing to expand to ensure that we get the, bright, the best and brightest employees and to ensure that we put ourselves 
in a position to win. Because if we have the best employees building the best products, we believe we will win. So, I talked about the U.S., but if I could for a moment, let's talk about Latin America. It's a growing market. We've been there for 30 plus years, and you're hearing a theme. 50 years in the U.S., 30 years in Latin America. We, can t we have continuity. We're working with the customers, the suppliers, and of course, the local communities. So, let's think about what that means. Over the last two decades, air travel has doubled in Latin America. The, historically, domestic traffic was the fastest growing segment. But in 2017, interregional traffic grew faster. Less than half of the top 20 cities are connected by one daily flight. What that tells you is the opportunity is huge. And we are there for our customers. Through 2007, the Latin American and Caribbean will need 2,700 new passenger and freighter aircraft valued at $350 billion. The in-service fleet will more than double during that time. We are the market leader in Latin America. We have 1,200 aircraft sold and a backlog of 600 aircraft. In other words, 71% of the backlog. I know you all like to hear percentages and statistics and the like, but we do have 71% of the backlog in Latin America. 700 aircraft in operation in Latin America and 57% share on the in-service fleet. The future of Airbus in Latin America looks similar to the U.S. We're investing in training centers, maintenance centers in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, mainly because that's what our customers want. They, they have said, we want you present, we want you involved, and we are building, and we are building in the local community just like we have in the U.S. When we talk about training centers, I think you've all heard the demand for pilots. There's an amazing requirement coming up over the next 20 years. You'll hear about numbers of 400,000. You'll hear about numbers of 600,000. Whichever number you look at, it's significant. And we are preparing through our training facilities to help to train the best pilots in the world. When we think about demand, overall demand, in the Americas, or North America specifically, we're looking at 5,000 single aisle aircraft in the next 20 years. And we see approximately 1,400 aircraft flying with today with 13 airlines in the U.S. So we are here today Airplanes are flying. I was just out on the ramp looking at a Spirit airplane as, as, uh, as we landed earlier. So you will see Airbus airplanes everywhere, and we hope you will soon see the 220. So let's be let's talk about mobile for a second. In 2018, on the single aisle, we delivered 50 aircraft in mobile exceeding our delivery targets. And our team is very, very proud of that. Since we back, began production just three years ago, we've delivered 103 aircraft to customers like ALC, Allegiant, American, Delta, Frontier, Hawaiian, JetBlue, and Spirit. We're currently at a production rate of just above four per month. 
By the end of 2019, we will be trending towards rate five. And while all this is occurring, we will be building side by side the A220 facility, the reason you are here today. And in doing that, we have 700 jobs today in three facilities in Mobile. And you can add another 250 vets to that with our contractors. The 220 valve will create another 400 jobs. And we expect a significant in jobs to, to support the supply chain, as we talked earlier. You will see significant investment. The original 320 valve cost approximately $600 million. The 220 valve we will invest approximately $300 million, or almost a billion dollars, right here in Mobile. In addition, we, we've invested in our engineering centers. Right out here, you'll see the Mobile Engineering Center, with, which does the global engineering for our wings on our airplanes. We have 450 engineers across the U.S., specifically in here in Mobile and in Wichita, Kansas. We also have a cabin engineering center, which we opened in 2007 in Mobile. Significant manufacturing and engineering in these <coughs> subsidiaries also exist in companies like Stellium, the manufacturing company, and PAG. So Stellium, Stellium Aerospace, is recognized as a leader in design, analysis, and development of advanced composites. These production facilities are in Canada and one in the U.S. They have 600 employees. So, as I look through, as, as I look forward, the summation of Airbus, in my opinion, is simple. We are building great products with great people in right here in the Americas. So with that, I'd like to open the floor for discussion, put Q&A, and we can talk about some of the things in more detail if you like. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to uh, borrow your microphone. We'll pass this around the room so that everyone can hear. And, uh, Let's begin our questions, Tim. Uh, since I picked on you, we'll go uh, we'll first. So, so, Tim, I do want to start by saying I could have regaled you for another 20 minutes as, as I was looking at this with other things we're doing in the U.S., whether it's Zephyr, our um, high altitude um, at UAV, which is uh, a state has set a record for 26 days in orbit, or Bahamas which is our autonomous uh, flying vehicle. So there's lots of other things we can talk about if you like, but I'm sure you have. Thanks, Jeff. Um, to me, for uh, just a couple of questions and quick ones. How much financial support are you getting from the Alabama local authorities or state authorities? What uh, is your pro projected production capacity here? And when will you meet that? And then finally, if I could just go back on the original decision to place the A220 here, that was at the time in the context of the trade dispute between Boeing and Bombardier. And it was understood to be a device that would uh, place the production final assembly in the United States and then get round the objection that it was a foreign aircraft. Boeing 
ultimately lost that complaint, why? What, could you just tell us what is the main, what are the economic reasons why it still makes sense to build that plane here? Well, let's start with your last question. And first of all, one of the largest markets for the 220 is the U.S. And we have, this is our industrial home in the U.S., in the Americas. We have skilled employees, we have the educational center, we have the engineering center. So it was a very, very logical thing to do. The other point, Tim, that I think is important is capacity. We believe between Maribel and Mobile, we have the proper footprint for growth going forward to satisfy our customers. So that's really why we're here in Mobile. To your earlier point about economic incentives, we have announced, there was um, some public announcements about local incentives. There will be a, another announcement, I believe, relatively shortly from the state, and I am not going to preempt them in terms of, uh, of, of the, uh, their announcement. Okay? What's the projected capacity? The, the current capacity on the 220 line is four, uh, four months here. And the 320 is currently, is at four and a half and directionally trending north. 